there's that, again, that healthy level of competition, but at the end of the day, we still, you know, hug each other and be like, hey, you did a great job. Thanks for kicking my butt. Hello, everyone. It's episode 96 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Master Amanda Meltzer. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host for Martial Arts Radio. Now, Whistlekick, I'm proud to say, makes the world's best sparring gear and some awesome apparel, all for those involved in traditional martial arts. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the very first time. If you're new to the show or you're just not familiar with what we make, please check out our sparring gear, like our boots. They're more comfortable, more durable. Basically, we took a standard design and found every way we could make it better. If you're used to replacing your gear frequently or looking at the tears in your boots and feeling sad about it, we offer a great alternative at a very good price. You can learn more about our gear and the rest of our products at whistlekick.com, and our gear is also available on Amazon. If you want the show notes, you can check those out at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, get on the newsletter list. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month. We will never sell your information, and sometimes we mail out a pretty generous coupon. On episode 96, we hear from Master Amanda Meltzer, a Taekwondo practitioner that I've known for a few years. She's an avid competitor and draws some great parallels between competition and aspects of life outside the ring. Master Melter started martial arts later in life than most of our guests, which I always find interesting, as we truly get to understand what drew someone to train. Let's welcome her to the show. Master Melter, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello. I'm excited to have you on, and, and we're going to chat, and I, I know we've got some some stuff that we'll get into, <laughs> and I won't give up any more than that. We'll see where, where the questions take us today. Okay. So uh, let's start. You know, I know you've listened to the show. Most of the people out there have listened at least once before. We always get going in the same way. How did you get started in the martial arts? Um, well, it was something I'd always wanted to try. Um, never got the chance to when I was younger. And my sister is a hairdresser, and she was working at this hair salon that was next to Lammy's Black Belt Academy. And Amy and Paul Lammy started getting their hair done by my sister and she knew who they were and they did martial arts. So she kept telling me I had to come down and meet these people and, you know, go to their studio and see what it was all about. And one day me and my sister and our friend Andy went down there and tried classes and I was hooked. What was it that hooked you? Uh, it was just something I'd always wanted to try and, once I actually got in there and did it, it was just so much fun and everyone there was having so much fun that it's just something I wanted to be a part of. Do you remember at all, you know, when you first kind of wanted to get started in martial arts? Because we don't have a lot of people that come on the show that got started as an adult. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but maybe if you want to tell us how old you were when you started. Uh, let's see, I was about... 23 or 24 when I started. Okay. So, you know, not that plenty of people don't start martial arts at that age, but we just haven't had a lot of those people come on the show. So it's nice to have that varied perspective. So here you are, early mid 20s, however you want to define it. Right. How long had you wanted to try martial arts at that time? Um, for a very long time. I don't really remember when I first started to, but it always been something I'd seen and was curious about and would, would have liked to try so it's just always was okay. kind of in the back of my mind okay all right did you ever did you have friends that did it as a kid no i didn't know anyone that did it okay so you so your your reason for not jumping in was more just you didn't have the resource you didn't have a place that you knew of nearby that you could try yeah and i'm not sure my mom would have really liked me to do it as when I was younger um, and I just didn't know anybody and I wasn't really an outgoing person so I, it's not something I probably would have said like hey I want to do this like when I was younger so okay can I pry a little bit and ask why <laughs> your mom wouldn't have been down for that um I don't I still don't really think 
she necessarily likes it <laughs> right now. She just the confrontational okay. part, um, the chance of getting hurt. Um, I'd always been interested in playing hockey too, and she was never really up for that. So, <laughs> okay, all right. She's, she's protective. Yeah. So not, not a bad thing as a mom to be protective. You're a mom, right? So, I mean, you, you know what that feeling is like. Yeah, it's it's hard to watch your kids get hurt. So. <laughs> All right, so that gives us an idea of kind of how you got started. And as we keep going on, we'll get more of a sense as to where you are now. But as I know you know, it's all about stories here on Martial Arts Radio. And I know you've got some good ones. I've heard some from you before. Why don't you take a second, tell us your best martial arts story. Um, I don't know, that's a hard question to answer. But I guess the one that kind of pops into my head was... Um, when I told you about a month or so ago at the Superfoot training, um, it was the weekend before my wedding, and there was a tournament. And I just remember um, one of the other competitors was there that I knew well. And I was like, okay, you, I'm going to do this tournament, but whatever you do, just don't hit me in the face. I'm getting married next weekend. And she was all nervous about it, but it, it turned out well. So Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, now, I think some people would would look at that situation and say, "Why? Why would you even give yourself that opportunity?" Right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's. it's I'm not going to say it's crazy because I understand the appeal of competition, right? And I understand the desire to 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 try to do everything. I mean, yeah. Gosh, anybody that that knows me knows. Anybody that's seen my Google Calendar <laughs> knows that there's like 97 things on each day. Yep. So I'm trying to cram a lot of life into a short period of time. But why? <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Just why? Um, well, I mean, it was our home tournament. So I kind of, not that I had to be there. My instructors would have understood if I didn't. Um, but I just, I love competing. And like you said, I don't like to miss anything. And if I... If I was just there watching, it would just tear me up inside. And I, I couldn't just sit there and watch my division go without me. What did your fiancé think? He was fine with it. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Good. Yeah. It's a supportive man. Yeah. It's like the kind that you want, right? Yeah. So, of course, I didn't know you before your martial arts time, right? Right. So I can't imagine, you know, I can imagine, but I, I can't speak to who you were before you were training. But let's go back. Let's pretend, you know, your, your sister never meets your instructors. You never start martial arts training. And we fast forward to now. How do you think your life would be different without martial arts? Um, well, I definitely think I wouldn't be as confident or as strong. Um, it's really taught me a lot about myself and the things that I'm able to do that I probably never would have. Um, and I actually met my husband through martial arts. So that would be a huge thing that I probably would have missed out on. That's yeah, that's kind of a big one there. Right? <laughs> yeah. So without him, diff no kids or at least different kids. And yeah, it, that's a pretty big chunk of your life. How did you meet him? Um, well, his stepfather and brother were at the studio. So I became friends with them first. Um, and then um, when his stepfather actually became ill, that's when he kind of came back home and refocused on his family. And he met, I met him there and uh, we became friends. And then, you know, as things moved on, you know, it just became our relationship. And here we are. <laughs> Great. You know, one of the, th the themes that actually doesn't seem to come up a lot on the show that I find interesting is the the romantic relationships inside and outside of martial arts. I think, you know, I, I've certainly, I've, I've had relationships with people inside martial arts and outside martial arts, and maybe you can offer your perspective on this, but it seems like for a lot of people that don't train in martial arts or don't have something that they are super passionate about like most people that train in martial arts it can be hard for them to understand that dedication of time and energy and money and, and your physical body right i mean we come out bruised <laughs> and banged up and 
sometimes mentally beat down. And a lot of people that don't train don't get that. Right. I think so it can be straining on a relationship. Yeah, I think it helps that he he doesn't train right now, but um, he's always been into martial arts and things like that. Um, so he he understands where I'm coming from and that, you know, it's kind of a part of me and who I am. All right. So, of course, your life would be pretty darn different. Let's pull it back. Let's, you know, let's let's go back to real reality. Okay. You know, you met your husband, you train all that. And here we are now. Yep. Think about a time in your life that was rough, however you want to define that. And tell us how your martial arts training helped you with that. Um, well, I think I would go back to the time when um, my husband's stepfather was ill. Um, he ended up having cancer. Um, and because our studio was such a tight-knit family, it was hard on all of us. Um, so we all kind of struggled through that together. And, you know, if I wasn't doing martial arts, I wouldn't have experienced this. But um, having been there and having that group of people to rely on, we were all going through the same things. And um, we were able to be there for him as a family and support him and his family through through the illness. And eventually he did pass away. So that was that was really hard. Um, and it was after he passed away that my hus now husband and I kind of became closer and so and you know unfortunately i've been part of some martial arts schools that have seen people pass away and it's 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 tough you know because i'm sure you you would well i don't know if you would put it this way but i i look at the people that i train with in kind of a different way than the friendships that i have outside of martial arts you know you you share sweat and you share hard work and sometimes you bleed on each other i mean that's a really intimate relationship even if you only see these people two three hours a week right there's something pretty foundational in the connection that you share with them and so you know i'm sure to to lose that person you know even if it's someone in in the school that you don't know really well right it can completely unsettle you so, you know, I'm sorry you had to go through that, but it sounds like maybe this is an example of one door closing and another opening with your husband and, and you building a stronger relationship out of that pain. Definitely it was. I mean, okay. in this um, we, we called him Big Joe and he was, you know, one of the highest ranking students in the school at that time and like one of our leaders that everyone looked to. Um, so it just really pulled us all together and helped us become more of a family. Good. How do you cope with something like that? I mean, are you the type to hit the heavy bag until your knuckles bleed or kind of hide and practice forms on your own? I mean, is there is there a, a physical outlet for you? Kind of a little of both. Your, um, okay. You need to get out some of that aggression. Um, so like kicking things, just, just being in class for me is helpful. Um, kicking things, just kicking the paddle. Um, and just being together as a group. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, um, someone that we both know, someone within our, our martial arts family that's been on the show. I'm remember, reminded of, his episode, Master Forsberg, talking about the loss of his father and, yeah. you know, just kind of reminded me of that, you know, that physical expression, you know, the, the need to hit things, the need to release that emotion in, in, in a physical way, that catharsis. And it's something that I don't think we talk about a lot in martial arts because we, you know, we work so hard to control our emotions, right? Right. But then sometimes there's just a whole lot of emotion and it's such a good outlet for that. It is. Uh, and I just remember being um, at a tournament. I think it was actually Master Jordan's tournament um, just after we found out how sick he really was. And I was practicing my pattern and 
patterns stress me out anyway. But at this point, I was just so emotionally overdone that um, I was in the middle of practicing my pattern. All of a sudden, I just stopped and just burst into tears. And I remember um, it was Master John Levy, who wasn't Master John Levy at the time, but she just came over and just hugged me. And she didn't know what was going on. She just thought I was upset because I messed up my pattern. But um, she just was there for me and just gave me that hug and was like, it's okay, you know, you can get through the pattern next time. And, you know, it, she didn't know the rest of the story, but at that time, but it just, it was nice to have someone that was just right there and just came over and knew something was wrong. And she didn't know me that well at the time. And, but she was there anyway. So that was really cool. When you look back on that moment now, why do you think you stopped? Why I stopped crying? No. Why, why, why did you stop your pattern? Oh, I just, when I get in the middle of my patterns, if I let my mind wander off mm. of the pattern onto anything, I just, I can't refocus. <laughs> Got it. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter what it is. If I don't focus completely, like some people can stop or some people know all the numbers, to every movement, and I just, I can't do that. I have to keep moving and keep it in my head. <laughs> Got it. Got it. How did the rest of that day finish up? Uh I don't really remember, to be honest. Um, I probably got through my pattern, but I really don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably okay. Yeah. Probably a good thing. <laughs> so, of course, I know how strong your relationship is with your instructors. Uh -huh. and But I'm wondering if there's somebody else, somebody else that has been really strong in your martial arts career, somebody that has been influential for you other than those two? Um, well, my best friend Amy started training with me when I started, like the week after I signed up, I told her about it and she was like, oh, I'm going to do that too. So she came over and joined. Um, so we were able to train together and we tested for our first degree black belts together. Um, and we've been friends since we were five. So we've kind of done everything together in our lives. Um, and after testing, you know, we got married six months apart. We, our children are two months and four days apart. So, um, just being able to share all of that with her and all the experiences of, of the Taekwondo family, um, with her was important to me and it made us better friends through that. Was it ever challenging having so much history and so much context with someone and then stepping into the dojang with them and you know potentially having to to build a different relationship with them yeah at times because i was i'm kind of more competitive she's pretty competitive but i'm probably more competitive so like she would always get mad at me because i would forget my pattern and like that morning before our tournament i would I'd be like, hey, can you show me how to do the pattern real quick? And she'd show me. And then I'd go out and beat her. And she'd be like, what? You didn't even know your pattern five minutes ago. And then you just beat me. So it's like things like that, you know. But we're basically sisters. So it it all evens out. <laughs> so there, there's some healthy rivalry in there. Yeah. But with a foundation of a lot of love. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. That That's good. And it's, you know, I think a lot of people build those type of relationships if they don't have them coming in. And I don't think a lot of people are lucky enough to have that strong relationship coming in to martial arts training. Um, right. At least I don't know a lot of people that have. I certainly did not. Any of my friends that started training didn't last very long. But I've been fortunate enough to build those relationships within martial arts and take them outside of training. I think that's probably a little more common. Right. Yeah, that was huge for me, like, because um, we train in New Hampshire, but our studio is under one of the schools in Vermont. So we were up there all the time to train with everyone there and all the Vermont tournaments and just making friendships with people, you know, at tournaments, going up through the ranks together, being at all the tournaments together. You know, you always know you're going to see most of the same faces. And there's that, again, that healthy level of competition. But at the end of the day, we still, you know, hug each other and be like, Hey, you did a great job. Thanks for kicking my butt or, you know, <laughs> so that's been huge for me. Cause I, I always had a hard time connecting to people and just knowing that I can go to Vermont and there's this group of people there waiting for me and are excited to see me when I get there. And it's a lot of fun. 
I may be biased, but Vermont kind of has the best people. It has a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we just touched on competition a little bit. Yes. We now know that you're a very competitive person. Yes. And that competition is important enough to you that you'll do it the week before your wedding. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to guess didn't wear a face mask. Uh, no. Because <laughs> I've never seen you wear a face mask, no. <laughs> so I'm guessing you didn't then either. What is it about competition that you enjoy? I, I, the rush. I mean, you just never know what could happen. I mean, it could go your way one minute and not the next and you just you're always learning something whether you win or lose and just that drive to be better next time do you think about competition when you're training uh is that, does that fuel your training at all i don't i guess probably not um but it probably should <laughs> <laughs> especially with what? patterns um I, I tend to be lazy with my patterns, so when it comes time for tournament season, it's always like, okay, i got to get back on those patterns and really brush up, so I should practice that more. Well, that sounds like it's motivating you. <laughs> it sounds like if you didn't have tournaments, then your patterns would always be lazy. Probably. You'd always be lazy about your patterns, right? Yeah. But sparring... Sparring is kind of your thing, isn't Sparring it? Sparring is kind of my thing, yeah. Okay. All right. So why? What is it about getting out there and mixing it up with people that you enjoy? Um, I just, I don't know. I just love the clash, the contact, the seeing who can get there first. And just when you've sparred someone before and you know they've gotten you and then the next time you get them, and it, I don't know. It's just fun. <laughs> Would you rather spar with someone that you've sparred before or somebody brand new? Um, I like both for different reasons because um, someone that I've sparred before, I kind of know what they're doing. So if I can find a new way to kind of trick them. But if it's someone I haven't sparred, um, I always learn something because um, I never know what they're going to do. So I have to be paying more attention. So I think we're getting a pretty good sense of you and who you are but let's talk about some of the pieces that you know honestly i i have no idea about you because we've had conversations but they've always been in a pretty narrow sense right. movies you a martial arts movie person at all um not specifically martial arts I, just all of the action stuff um i like those kinds of things not necessarily martial arts movies do you have any favorites that we could at least sneak in as a martial arts movie. <laughs> uh, well, best of the best is always good. Okay, we're going. We're going back for that yeah, one. Yeah, I mean it's kind of a tradition. You kind of just have to watch it. <laughs> but um, like Karate Kid, I and I know it sounds probably silly, but the new Karate Kid, I just I really enjoy watching that one. Maybe it's Jackie Chan. He's just funny. I think Jackie Chan's performance in that movie is not just one of the best roles in a martial arts movie, one of the best roles in a movie that I've ever seen. I mean, it's, and maybe that's because of context for Jackie Chan. You know, I'm used to him being not such a good actor and not having a dramatic role and just kind right. of beating people up. But it just really seemed like an, an honest portrayal. I mean, the car for... And I'm, we're not really giving away anything for someone that hasn't seen it. Right. Uh, and if you haven't, you need to. Yeah. Um, you know, let's forgive for a moment the fact that it's called The Karate Kid and they're doing Kung Fu. I mean, let's, well, just, yeah. let's let that go. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of people got hung up on that. Well, you know. They couldn't, they couldn't move past it. Um, but I thought Jackie Chan did an amazing job acting that role making it his own but i felt like there was quite a bit of homage to pat Morita and the original karate kid just the way that role was written and the way he played it i would agree now you've seen the original yes right yes was that something you saw as a as a kid before you did martial arts yeah i mean i i've probably seen bits and pieces i can't remember ever watching the whole thing through probably i know i have but um 
I remember bits and pieces of it. What is it about Best of the Best that you like? I think it was probably the first martial arts movie I watched after really starting martial arts. And one of my instructors, Paul, you know, kind of basically said I had to watch this movie. And it's kind of like, okay, so this is what we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's a classic. Yeah. You know, and of course, anyone that hasn't seen it, you should watch it as soon as you're done listening to this. Yes. I mean, there's there's some movies that I think we all need to see, and that's definitely on the list. Right. And if you haven't seen The Expendables, that those are really good, too. It's got all the martial arts heroes and a bunch of other action heroes in them. They're great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And especially The Expendables 2, where they brought in, you know, I mean... We'll, we'll link to it, uh, to the IMDb page. But just the cast is just ridiculous. Yeah, all and, of them are. Chuck Norris is in one, and just the way they play off on the jokes and things like that is yeah. really funny. Chuck Norris and Jet Li, yeah. and I mean, just, just absolutely fantastic. So Yeah, those are some of my favorites. Yeah. Here, I'm writing that down, Expendables 2. <laughs> we got to make sure we get that in there, right? Yes. So you mentioned Jackie Chan as being one of your favorites, but is he your favorite martial arts actor? Yeah, I guess I'd have to say he is as far as an actor, because I haven't really seen a lot of things that Chuck Norris has been in. So I know I don't I, think you should admit that I publicly. <laughs> we may have to cut that part out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's just a funny person. Plus he does martial arts. So it's just like right. that goofy side, but also like the martial arts side. Anybody else that you enjoy? Uh, those are the main two, really. Books? Martial arts books? I haven't really read any martial arts books. I have the Encyclopedia of Taekwondo that I borrowed for my <laughs> testing <laughs> that I was studying, but beyond that... it's <laughs> a lot of material in That's, that. yeah. It's kind of heavy reading. It's not really something you just sit down with. Sure. <laughs> now, we've talked a little bit. You wrote some things. May, may not be much of a martial arts book reader, but <laughs> it was your master's thesis, if I remember. Yes. Was on martial arts? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So I have my master's degree in special education. So I wrote my paper on the use of martial arts um, with people with special needs. Um, and it was kind of an overview of all special needs um, because the martial arts is a great place for kids who need work with like attention. So ADD, ADHD, it can do a lot for them. Um, and also people with physical disabilities, just showing them that they, they can do this too. Um, it's not just people who are completely able-bodied that can do martial arts. And I think there's, you know, you see videos going around of, of people, you know, with crutches or, you know, missing limbs or different things that, that are doing martial arts and, and they're making it work. So it just was kind of an inspiration for me. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I've always found interesting is that martial arts has had a substantial impact on some special needs individuals where nothing else has. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of searching on the internet or on YouTube to find some tear jerking inspirational story about someone that, that goes from being from having a lot of really significant challenges, physical challenges, emotional challenges, and through even just a couple years of martial arts, just a huge improvement. Right. And part, and not all of it is the physical part working out. It's, it's also, again, going back to the family, that support system. I mean, it's, it's not a team sport, but you have all those people around you that are doing the same thing that you're doing and encouraging you. Um, so it's just a, a support system for, for these kids that need someone next to them saying, you can do this. Now, you know, we, we won't get into specifics of, of where or anything, but, you know, not only is your 
education and special ed, it's your, your career is also. Do you bring any of the principles of what you've learned in martial arts into your the way you work with these children? Um, with my classroom right now, it it's it won't really help except for you know just the focus part. You know, we're always refocusing back to what we're doing. Um, it's more my training supporting me in um, helping them. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> It does. I'd, I'd like you to expound on that because that's that just kind of made my eyes bug out because I hadn't considered it from that perspective before. Um, well, my classroom consists of five very active um, boys with autism and aggressive behaviors. So just staying on top of them and, and knowing what to expect um, when they're kind of going through rough times, it it's helpful for me to be able to react quickly Um and be kind of one step ahead of them. So I don't, it's not a sparring match, but it's still reading people's bodies and knowing how they're feeling and reading their face and, and to expect what they might be thinking or want to do next. Okay. If you, I want to make sure I'm asking this in the right way. <laughs> so I know that there are, a number of people out there who teach some who have their own schools that are, are listening to this show right now and may listen in the future. What would you suggest to them? You know, you're, you're coming from the academic side, but with a substantial amount of martial arts training, you know, you can, you can combine these things in a way that I think a lot of people can't. Right. You can understand both pieces. If someone wanted to take on a special needs student or start a specific program for special needs, what advice, you know, what kind of bullet points might you offer them as suggestions on how to move forward with that or, or things not to forget or to remember? I don't know what I don't know, I guess, in asking this question. So right. maybe you can understand where I'm going and fill in the gaps. Um, I would say just movement is important keeping them moving you can't be sitting for too long and with my students now just what a difference it's made just keeping them moving we do everything kind of on the go they're not sit at a desk do this activity type of, of kid you need to be teaching as you're you know walking as you're running as you're you know lifting and moving and they just need that sensory input of moving and the more you try to get them to sit and just listen, it's it's not going to work. And of course, in martial arts, the equivalent of sitting is standing in, in ready stance. Uh, karate futadashi or taekwondo chunbi, you know, whatever, whatever you call it. Right. And part of that is the discipline that they need. Um, but just keeping as you're teaching, just keep it flowing as as you're showing them what you want them to do. Okay. So what might that look like if I could, you know, tie you down to be a little more specific? Um, I would say just limited, we call it mat chat at our studio, limited times of that, which I think for most kids classes, it's like that anyway. You can't keep a group of three, four or five year olds sitting for an extended period of time, uh, but just make everything hands on and as much as possible. Okay. All right. Any other tips? Keep them moving. Yeah, I think that's the biggest what? one. Just that's the big one. Yeah, okay. I'm not All an right. expert by any means. No, that that's fine. I mean, this. I don't know that there are a lot of people that are. With this, I mean, to be honest, I. I don't know a lot of martial arts schools that will take on someone that at least not in a, a um, standard classroom, you know, I, uh, even personally, I when I, I had a mark my own school for a couple of years and I did work with someone who was special needs, but it was one on one. Okay. I mean, we tried one class mainstream and it just didn't, it didn't happen. I mean, right. the, they drew all the attention away. And right. um, so we worked one on one and that was really successful because I was able to keep them moving and keep that focus going. But for me, it was all trial and error. Right. A lot you of times know, that one-on-one -on -one attention is best. Um, a group setting really doesn't work for a lot of these kids. 
So you mentioned before you've got a couple kids. Yep. Uh, of course, you are a woman. Yes. Um, I mean, <laughs> right. Um, one of the things that I hear some people talk about is the challenge of balancing family, career, children, martial arts. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't want to come off as sexist. I don't want it to sound that way, but you know, at least the way I understand in, in your family and in, in the way a lot of families operate, there's an element of, of nurturing and certainly something similar in your career. And it's got to make balancing all that difficult. Do you have any thoughts on that or, or advice for either women that are considering starting training or maybe have already started training and feeling overwhelmed or women that are already in martial arts and are looking out a couple of years and wanting children and wondering how they're going to balance. I mean, I would definitely say don't let it stop you. Um, I was training for about six years before my son was born. Um, and obviously before that I was able to train a lot more. Um, even before I was married, I was training five to six days a week um, and after I got married, I had to slow it down a little bit. And then, you know, when I was pregnant, I was, I still attended at least two to three classes a week, was helping teaching. Um, and I was still able to balance it. And then after my son was born, um, I had to, you know, cut back a little bit more because I didn't like having him out. And my husband was able to take the kids when, whenever he can. But uh, my son's been going two classes with me since he was four weeks old and my daughter since she was six weeks old. Um, so it's definitely doable. You know, I had the car packed with the travel swing and the toys and the food and, you know, we'd show up and unload and we were there for the night and pack everything back up and home we went. And, you know, the other parents were great too. They knew like I was there helping to teach. So I was helping their kids. So, you know, people are always willing to hold your baby if you're doing something, you know, it's never hard to find someone to do right. that. Right. Um, but they, I've always had all the parents, you know, be really great about, the kids being there and, you know, interacting with the other children that might be sitting on the sidelines waiting for their brother or sister or the next class. Um, so just again, going back to that Taekwondo family, they were always there for me, you know, whether it was, you know, playing with the kids or entertaining them with a different toy that they had brought for their kid. And it, it just, it works. <laughs> Sometimes they're loud and distracting and I apologize to the parents, the other parents <laughs> for that, but you know, they're understanding and, they're there to help me. So it works out. <laughs> I've trained in multiple schools where uh, both babies and or dogs <laughs> may wander onto the training floor yes. at any time. And it's just a added element of awareness. It is. Don't kick the, don't kick the dog. Don't kick the baby. Yep. Yeah. My children were trained, you know, very young that you don't walk on the mat. You need to stay on the side and, I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> Do your kids train now? My son just started. Um, he's on a little break for T-ball. Um, that's really his thing. But it's important to me that they at least try it and have the experience of it. Um, but he does enjoy it. And then my daughter is very much looking forward to training. I think she'll be more the one that will be into it more than my okay. son. But um, She's younger? She's the youngest, yeah. yep. She's three. Okay. And my son's five, or almost okay. five. All right. So I think someone could, could chop out any five minutes of this conversation and really get a sense of how important martial arts is to you, how much it's influenced who you are. Yes. But because you're still going, I'm guessing that you have stuff that you're looking forward to or goals that you're working towards. Could you tell us a bit about what's keeping you moving forward? Um. Really, I guess a lot of it is competition. I just love competition. Um, recently got my fourth degree, which I really didn't, I never expected that when I started out. Um, and just seeing everyone else coming up behind me and, you know, being there for them, and especially for my kids, hopefully. I'd, I'd love to be able to put a black belt on one of my kids someday. Hmm. That's, I've known a few people who have been able to do that. And that yeah, I've, it I've always seen, looks pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. 
so if someone has, you know, questions about anything that we've talked about, or, you know, maybe, you know, they, they want to pick your brain a little bit about special ed stuff or whatever, is there a way people can get a hold of you that you're willing to share? Uh, I can put my email out there. <laughs> I don't check okay. it very often, but. <laughs> okay. Um, that's amanda.meltzer24 at gmail. Okay. Yeah, so we won't put that in the show notes. Um, that'll just be right there for people. So okay. if you want to just give it one more time. Um, it's my full name, amanda.meltzer, M-E-L-T-Z-E-R, with the number 24 at gmail.com. Okay. Great. And before we go, any parting advice for the people listening? Just keep training. Um, don't let anything hold you back. Thank you for listening to episode 96 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Master Meltzer. If you like the show, be sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both Android and iOS. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember, we randomly check out all the different places people leave podcast reviews. And if we read yours on the air, go ahead, email us, and we're going to send you a free box of some great Whistlekick stuff. Those reviews help us so much. I don't think people fully understand how important those are. And we actually haven't seen any new reviews in a couple weeks. So please take a couple minutes, help us out, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever works for you. Leave us a review. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a great place to do that as well. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always, you guessed it, Whistlekick. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like the fantastic sparring boots. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our discounted wholesale program. But until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.